द टॉपिक इज एनाटोमिकल स्नाफ पॉक्स The anatomical snuff box is an elongated triangular depression seen on the lateral side of the dorsum of hand when the thumb is hyperextended. In the picture, we are seeing the hand from the dorsal view. On the dorsolateral aspect, with the thumb kept in hyper extended condition we can see a triangular depression at the root of thumb and that triangular depression seen on the lateral side of the dorsum of hand at the root of thumb is called anatomical snuff box boundary of anatomical snuff box there are three tendons that make up the boundary what are they anterolaterally there are two tendons see the first tendon the most lateral one is called abductor pollicis longus and next to it and running side by side with abductor pollicis longus is the tendon of extensor pollicis brevis so abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis these two form the anterolateral boundary whereas the posteromedial boundary you see this is the lateral side this is the medial side we are shifting from lateral to medial the posterior medial boundary is formed by the tendon of extensor pollicis longus so this is the tendon of extensor policies longus posteromedial boundary now coming to the floor 
in between the two sets of tendons that form the anterolateral boundary and the posterior medial boundary the triangular region has a floor that is formed by the following bones let me first show you the bony framework of the concerned region you know on the radial side of the forearm we get the radius this is the lower end of radius lower end of radius articulates with the carpal bones and carpal bones are arranged in two rows so there are two carpal bones we know the proximal row of carpal bone from lateral to medial is scaphoid lunate triquetral pisiform so this bone must be scaphoid and the distal row bone from lateral to medial is trapezium trapezoid capitate hamate so this is trapezium now this trapezium bone in turn articulate with the first metacarpal so this is the first metacarpal bone and the first metacarpal bone articulate with the proximal phalanx of thumb and proximal phalanx lead to the distal phalanx and this bony skeleton ends over here it is important to note that the thumb only has two phalangeal bone in contrast to the other medial four fingers each of which has three phalangeal bones okay now we have got three tendons abductor pollicis longus extensor pollicis brevis and extensor pollicis longus each of the three tendon has a separate attachment abductor pollicis longus is inserted to the radial side of the base of first metacarpal so this is the attachment of abductor pollicis longus extensor pollicis brevis is attached to the radial side of base of proximal phalanx of thumb and extensor pollicis longus is attached to the base of distal phalanx so abductor pollicis longus attachment this is the attachment of extensor pollicis brevis and last but not the least the attachment of extensor pollicis longus okay so the floor 
of the triangular space bound by this three tendon is formed by two bones these bones belong to the most lateral bones of the two rows of carpals these are scaphoid and trapezium so scaphoid and trapezium these two bones form the floor of anatomical snub box so where are they the scaphoid and trapezium let us tally the picture scaphoid and trapezium okay trapezium and scaphoid they are forming the bony floor okay roof is formed by roof is formed by the structure that is covering all these thing and what is the structure that is covering them obviously skin and superficial fascia until and unless we remove the skin and superficial fascia we cannot see them we cannot see these tendons so skin and superficial fascia is forming the roof see these are the tendons seen from the lateral side we have removed the skin and the superficial fascia and what we are getting to see we are getting to see the tendon of abductor pollicis longus next to it the extensor pollicis brevis forming the anterolateral boundary and the tendon of extensor pollicis longus that is inserted into the base of the distal phalanx forming the posterior medial boundary so abductor pollicis longus is inserted over here at the radial side of base of first metacarpal extensor pollicis brevis radial side of base of proximal phalanx and extensor pollicis longus radial side of base of distal phalanx in between these three tendons there is this triangular area and the floor of the triangular area is formed by the carpal bones scaphoid and trapezium outline of scaphoid outline of trapezium
what are the contents the content is only one and that is the radial artery which passes below the aforesaid three tendons and what are the structures that cross the roof you know the roof is formed by the covering structure that is the skin and superficial fascia when you remove the skin we can see structure that cross the roof deep to skin in the superficial fascia what are the superficial fascial structure there are two of them one is the cephalic vein that is running from medial to lateral side cephalic vein and the terminal branches of superficial radial nerve you know radial nerve has got two branch superficial and deep the deep branch is called the posterior interosseous nerve that supply the most of the muscles of the back of forearm and the other terminal branch is superficial radial nerve and that superficial radial nerve enters the anatomical snub box deep to the skin from lateral to medial side that is the terminal part of superficial radial nerve let's see whether there is some other picture of that well you can see the cephalic vein in this picture that is passing from medial to lateral side under cover of the skin cephalic vein the superficial branch of radial nerve has not been shown in the picture that has been depicted in the diagram the terminal part of superficial radial nerve what is the clinical correlation clinical significance of anatomical snub box is as follows the pulsation of radial artery can be felt in the anatomical snub box radial artery pulse can be felt over here if there is tenderness in the anatomical snub box that indicate the fracture of scaphoid bone where is the scaphoid bone that is the scaphoid which is the lateral bone of the proximal row of carpals so scaphoid fracture will result in tenderness in the region of anatomical snuff box next is the cephalic vein over here you see the cephalic vein
this is often used for giving IV fluid. And last but not the least, the superficial branch of radial nerve can be rolled over the tendon of extensor pollicis longus. See, this is the superficial branch of radial nerve. Radial nerve. And that can be rolled over the tendon of extensor pollicis longus. So the superficial branch of radial nerve which is crossing above the tendon of extensor pollicis longus can also be rolled over against it. extensor pollicis longus so the superficial branch of radial nerve can be rolled over we can move it or roll it over against the tendon of extensor pollicis longus because the superficial branch of radial nerve is crossing above the tendon of extensor pollicis longus. That is all about the anatomical snuff box. Now we are going to discuss about extensor retinaculum. The deep fascia on the back of the wrist is thickened to form an oblique fibrous band. It is called extensor retina coulomb so extensor retina coulomb is nothing but the thickening of deep fascia in a band like manner on the back of the wrist so we are seeing the wrist from the dorsal aspect this is the lateral side this is the medial side this is the dorsal view Again, on the dorsal view, this is the lateral side, medial side, dorsal view. The retina coulomb or the thickening of the deep fascia in the form of a band is oblique. and it is directed downward and medially downward and medially what are the attachment the medial end of extensor retina coulomb is attached to the styloid process of ulna styloid process of ulna Triquetral and pisiform bone.
tri quetral and the overlying the tri quetral the pc form so that is the attachment on the medial side the lateral end is attached to the lower part of anterior border of radius lower part of anterior border of radius it is attached so the attachment on the lateral and medial side has been described on medial side the attachment is on the styloid process of ulna pc form and triquetral whereas on the lateral side it is on the lower part of the anterior border of radius so that is about the attachment now we are coming to the structures that are passing beneath it you see the long flexor tendons are basically passing beneath the extensor retina coulomb so if we draw the extensor retina coulomb the outline of it actually we will see that the long flexor tendons are passing beneath it one by one from lateral to medial side now this is the transverse section of the forearm just above the wrist at this level we have taken a transverse section like this A transverse section has taken and the section will produce a view like this where this is the lateral side or the radial side this is the medial side this is the palmar aspect and obviously the site of the retina coulomb itself is on the dorsal aspect on the dorsal aspect we are getting to see the tracing of the retina coulomb that is the extensor retina coulomb seen on the transfer section just above the level of wrist extensor 
लेटिन आकुला there is a space deep to the retina coulomb and to the dorsal aspect of lower end of radius and ulna let us draw the dorsal aspect of the lower end of radius this is the dorsal aspect of lower end of radius this is the dorsal aspect of lower end of ulna so in between the extensor retina coulomb above and the dorsal aspect of both lower ends of radius and ulna there is a space and it is divided into six compartments by five septa extending from the retina coulomb to the dorsal aspect of lower end of radius and ulna so the septa are as follows okay where are the septi these are the septi they are running inwards from the extensor retina coulomb up to the dorsal aspect of lower end of radius and ulna there are five of them 1 2 3 4 5 five 70 and these five septi divide the space into six compartment and these compartments are numbered 1 to 6 from lateral to medial side One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six compartments. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Next, we will see what are the structures or tendons that pass through each of the compartment. This is the first compartment. This is the second. This is the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth from lateral to medial. So first, on to the first compartment. There are two tendons that passes through the first compartment. The tendons of abductor pollicis longus. and accompanying it the tendon of extensor pollicis brevis these two these two abductor pollicis longus this one and extensor pollicis brevis they form the structure that is passing through the compartment number 1 okay abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis next through the compartment number 2 there are two structures extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis through the second compartment 
this is the first compartment this is the second what are they extensor carpi radial is longus extensor carpi radial is briefis so they are at the extensor carpi radial is longus extensor carpi radial is brevis then through the third compartment let us clear it only one that is the extensor pollicis longus so keeping the perspective first compartment second compartment that is the third compartment third compartment gives passage to the extensor pollicis longus only one so let's see the third compartment the third compartment there is only one that is the extensor pollicis longus now we are shifting to the fourth compartment the fourth compartment is the largest compartment and it houses the extensor digitorum and extensor indices let us first color the extensor digitorum tendons these are the tendons of extensor digitorum and these digitorum tendons are actually going to the medial four digits so these tendons are extensor digitorum there is a number fourth compartment joining the extensor digitorum tendon of index finger is another tendon that join the extensor digitorum tendon of the index finger that is called extensor indices so both the extensor digitorum and extensor indices are running through the compartment number 4 so let's see so this is the compartment number 4 extensor digitorum and indices running through them this is the extensor digitorum and underneath it is the tendon of extensor indices then we are shifting to the fifth compartment so we have done 1 2 and 3 4 now the turn to shift to the fifth compartment what is the fifth one the fifth compartment holds the extensor digiti minimi that is the extensor tendon for the little finger extensor digiti minimi an extensor digiti minimi it joins extensor digiti minimi it join the extensor digitorum of little finger 
Look, the green color is the extensor digitorum. This one. So extensor digitorum of the little finger is joined with the extensor digiti minimi that runs through the fifth compartment. So let us see the fifth compartment. This is the extensor digiti minimi. And we are on to the last one. We can see the name extensor carpi ulnaris. Let's get to see the last one of the lot that is the extensor carpi ulnaris. And this is the tendon of extensor carpi ulnaris on the most medial side, sixth compartment. So, sixth compartment houses the tendon of extensor carpi ulnaris. So that is the extensor carpi ulnaris and that is the extensor digiti minimi through the fifth compartment. So there are six compartments, six ophiofibrous tunnels which gives passage to the to all these extensor tendon. Now one thing is important that when the tendons are passing through the osseofibrous tunnel, for example, take any one of them, suppose the tendon of extensor carpial nadis. This is surrounded by a synovial sheath. This synovial sheath, what is the synovial sheath? You can see the synovial sheath around the tendons. Synovial sheaths are tubular membrane bound double layered pouches. If there is a, there is a tendon cross section, then the synovial sheaths are around a tendon like this and it has got two layers. One the inner layer and the another is the outer layer. Inner layer is called visceral layer and outer layer is called parietal layer. So this double layered membranous covering has a fluid in between the two layers. This fluid is called synovial fluid. On a cross section for easy depiction the synovial sheaths are drawn like this. The two layers are not clearly depicted. The importance of synovial sheath is that it is a tubular fluid filled pouch around the length of the tendons whenever the tendon is passing through any osseofibrous canal in order to reduce the friction of the tendon when it is undergoing movement. So the thing is that all the tendons where a single or double they are covered outside by a tubular membranous covering. You can see the membranous covering like a halo around each of the tendons that is called synovial sheath. The function of extensor retinaculum is to hold all this extensor tendon in place on the back of the wrist and prevent their displacement when the hand is extended at the wrist joint. 
so that is about the extensor retina coulomb the topic is synovial sheath of the long flexor tendons long flexor tendons so first of all what are long flexor tendons and then we will discuss what is a synovial sheath the long flexor tendon refers to the tendons which run up to the digits and help in their flexion for the thumb the long flexor tendon is the flexor pollicis longus and for the rest of the medial four fingers that is for the index middle ring and little fingers there are two sets of long flexor tendon for each of the medial four fingers and they are the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus that is the flexor digitorum superficialis tendon and deep to the flexor digitorum superficialis beneath them running along the same line deep to them the tendon of flexor digitorum profundus shown in red dots that are running deep to the flexor digitorum superficialis tendons so there are four flexor digitorum profundus tendon underneath the four flexor digitorum superficialis tendons and all together the flexor pollicis longus which is one in number the four tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis and the four tendons of flexor digitorum profundus are known as the long flexor tendon of the fingers now each of the long flexor tendons are basically running over the bones they are running over the metacarpals and then the phalangeal bones and also on the carpal bones so during their course they are basically running through a osseofibrous tunnel which is formed by the bed of the bone underneath and the covering the fascia overlying the tendons so the tendons are passing between the deep fascia above them which is covering them and over the bones below them in a osseofibrous tunnel and these tendons are constantly moving in order to flex the fingers during different movements so these tendons when they move they have that possibility of undergoing friction against the osseous bed and in order to reduce the friction during their movement each of the tendon is invested or enveloped by a double layered fluid covered membrane that is called tendon synovial sheaths 
सो व्हाट आर साइनोफियल शीत अ साइनोफियल शीत इज बेसिकली अ डबल लेयर्ड मेम्ब्रेनस कवरिंग over the tendon of the muscles having an outer parietal and inner visceral layer and it is filled with synovial fluid and they are meant to reduce the friction let us see a schematic diagram suppose this is the bone this is the overlying periosteum of bone above the bone passing is the tendon that is the tendon that is passing through the bone now look the tendon is surrounded by a double layered membranous pouch which extend like a tube so that is a tubular pouch and that tubular pouch has a inner visceral layer that directly covers the tendon and an outer parietal layer in between the visceral and parietal layer there is presence of synovial fluid in between them this tubular double layered pouch actually is reducing the friction between the tendon and underlying bone so it is a lubricating device if we just look at the cross section of such a tendon what we will see we will see a visceral layer a parietal layer and intermediate space that is filled up with the synovial fluid so let's see a cross section now you can understand this is the outline of the tendon surrounding the tendon obviously is the visceral layer and outside the visceral layer the outer layer is the parietal layer parietal layer visceral layer now there is a place where the visceral layer is continuous with the parietal layer at this region and this region where the visceral layer is continuous with the parietal layer is called the meso tendon and through the meso tendon the blood vessel enter the tendon to supply it let's see the three dimensional view where is the meso tendon the meso tendon is basically this region where the parietal layer that is outside layer is in continuity of the 
visceral layer so the connection between the visceral and parietal layer is called the meso tendon and through the meso tendon the blood vessel enter to supply the tendon so that is the basic idea and structure of a synovial sheath now coming to the next part of our discussion the synovial sheath around the long flexor tendons that is the tendons of flexor pollicis longus flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus serve as a lubricating device to prevent their friction while they move within the osseofibrous tunnels and they are double layered tubular membranous covering consisting an outer and inner layer and having a meso tendon which help to convey the blood vessel that has been discussed so far there are three type of synovial sheath we get to see around the tendon of the flexor pollicis longus we get to see the digital synovial sheath which is known as the radial bursa radial bursa so this radial bursa is basically commencing below the flexor retinaculum so it extend so it extend from the forearm about one finger breadth below flexor retinaculum and it continues distally through the thumb up to the tip of the thumb up to the distal phalanx that is called the radial bursa the tubular synovial sheath of extensor pollicis longus which extend from one finger breadth below the flexor retinaculum proximally up to the distal phalanx distally so one is the radial bursa next we get the term ulnar bursa an ulnar bursa is the common synovial sheath for the tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus so we draw the tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis four of them and beneath them in the dotted line the corresponding flexor digitorum profundus so ulnar bursa is the common synovial sheath of the long flexor tendon for the medial four fingers while they pass through the carpal tunnel and this extend proximally into the forearm about a finger breadth proximal 
to the flexor retinacula that is about 5 centimeter proximal to flexor retinaculum that is the flexor retinaculum so 5 centimeter proximal to flexor retinaculum is the proximal attachment of proximal extent of ulnar bursa and distally it extend in the palm up to the middle of the shaft of metacarpal bones so the distal attachment is up to the middle of the shaft of the metacarpals now the metacarpal bones are located like this if we clear down the picture the metacarpal bones are situated in the region of the palm 1 2 3 4 5 5 of them from lateral to medial there is a head of metacarpal base of metacarpal and the intervening is the shaft of the metacarpal now up to the middle of the shaft of the metacarpal the ulnar bursa is extended in the palm distal extent of ulnar bursa up to the middle of the shaft of the metacarpal so we have got the radial bursa we have got the ulnar bursa okay so radial bursa around the flexor pollicis longus ulnar bursa for flexor digitorum superficialis plus flexor digitorum profundus now we get another thing that is called digital synovial sheets the flexor tendon of the digits when they pass through the fibrous flexor sheets are enclosed in the digital synovial sheath and this digital synovial sheath this is the digital synovial sheath of index finger it extends from the head of metacarpal to the distal phalanx there is a metacarpal head and there is the distal phalanx middle phalanx proximal phalanx distal phalanx middle phalanx and proximal phalanx this is the metacarpal so from the head of the metacarpal up to the distal phalanx is the extent of digital synovial sheath It is important that the digital synovial sheath of the little finger that is to say this one is continuous with the none other than ulnar bursa. So the digital synovial sheath of little finger is in continuity with the ulnar bursa. If we take a cross section of that finger we can see the digital synovial sheath in a cross section of the finger that is the cross section of the proximal phalanx arching over it is the deep fascia of the finger that deep fascia of the finger is called fibrous flexure sheath of digit and this deep fascia convert the underlying bone into a tunnel and through this tunnel the tendon of flexor digitorum superficialis and underneath it is running the flexor digitorum profundus 
and both of the tendons are enclosed in a synovial sheath this is the visceral layer of the synovial sheath just outside the tendons and this is the parietal layer which lines the osseofibrous tunnel formed by the deep fascia of the finger and the palmar surface of proximal phalanx and in between them we get the synovial fluid so the visceral layer of the digital synovial sheath is depicted in yellow and it directly lines the tendon of flexor digitorum superficialis above and flexor digitorum profundus below and the parietal layer in black that lines the osseofibrous tunnel which is formed by the fibrous flexor sheath above and palmar surface of the proximal phalanx below in between the visceral layer and parietal layer we get a lubricating synovial fluid next we move on to the ulnar bursa and how it looks like on the cross section in the region of the carpus or the wrist it is a cross section of wrist at the level of the distal row of carpal bones the distal row of carpal bones from lateral to medial are trapezium trapezoid capitate and most medially hamet the flexor retinaculum is converting it into a osseofibrous tunnel the four tendons of flexor digitorum profundus sorry superficialis lying in a superficial plane while the tendons of flexor digitorum profundus also four of them they lie deep to the tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis and both of them are covered by the visceral layer of the ulnar bursa which lie in direct contact just outside the tendons depicted in yellow and this visceral layer is reflected as the outer parietal layer which line the inner surface of flexor retinaculum and the palmar surface of the carpals concave palmar surface of the carpals so that is the parietal layer of ulnar bursa and the inner layer is the visceral layer it is to be noted that the outline of ulnar bursa is somewhat like this the tendons of fds and fdp they are invaginating into the ulnar bursa from the lateral side to the medial side so the lateral side of the ulnar bursa is open and the medial side is closed
so as a whole the digital synovial sheets radial varsa ulnar varsa all are the parts of the synovial sheet of long flexor tendon of fingers so synovial sheath covering the long flexor tendon of fingers are three types ulnar bursa the common sheath for the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus tendon the radial bursa the sheath covering the flexor pollicis longus and last but not the least the digital synovial sheath the digital synovial sheath is this one they cover the long flexor tendon in each of the medial four digits digital synovial sheath radial bursa and ulnar bursa so that is all about the digital synovial sheath of the long flexor tendons of fingers